Third part of chapter six of the first volume of the Life of Reason. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Fredrik Karlsson. The Life of Reason by George Santayana. Side note. Limits of Insight. This miracle of insight, as it must seem to those who have not understood its natural and accidental origin, extends only so far as does the analogy between the object and the instrument of perception. The gift of intuition falls in proportion as the observer's bodily habit differs from the habit and body observed. Misunderstanding begins with constitutional divergence and deteriorates rapidly into false imputations and absurd myths. The limits of mutual understanding coincide with the limits of similar structure and common occupation, so that the distortion of insight begins very near home. It is hard to understand the minds of children unless we retain unusual plasticity and capacity to play. Men and women do not really understand each other, what rules between them being not so much sympathy as habitual trust, idealization, or satire. Foreigners' minds are pure enigmas, and those attributed to animals are a grotesque compound of Aesop and physiology. When we come to religion, the ineptitude of all the feelings attributed to nature or the gods is so egregious that a sober critic can look to such fables only for a pathetic expression of human sentiment and need, while, even apart from the gods, each religion itself is quite unintelligible to infidels who have never followed its worship sympathetically or learned by contagion the human meaning of its sanctions and formulas. Hence the stupidity and want of insight commonly shown in what calls itself the history of religions. We hear, for instance, that Greek religion was frivolous, because its mystic awe and momentous practical and poetic truths escape the Christian historian accustomed to a catechism and a religious morality, and similarly Catholic piety seems to the Protestant an aesthetic indulgence, a religion appealing to sense, because such is the only emotion its externals can awaken in him, unused as he is to a supernatural economy reaching down into the incidents and affections of daily life. Language is an artificial means of establishing unanimity and transferring thought from one mind to another. Every symbol or phrase, like every gesture, throws the observer into an attitude to which a certain idea correspond in the speaker, to fall exactly into the speaker's attitude is exactly to understand. Every impediment to contagion and imitation in expression is an impediment to comprehension. For this reason language, like all art, becomes pale with years. Words and figures of speech lose their contagious and suggestive power, the feeling they once expressed can no longer be restored by their repetition. Even the most inspired verse, which boasts not without a relative justification to be immortal, becomes in the course of ages a scarcely legible hieroglyphic. The language it was written in dies. A learned education and an imaginative effort are requisite to catch even a vestige of its original force. Nothing is so irrevocable as mind. Unsure the ebb and flood of thought, the moon comes back, the spirit naught. Side note. Perception of character. There is, however, a wholly different and far more positive method of reading the mind, or what in a metaphorical sense is called by that name. This method is to read character. Any object with which we are familiar teaches us to divine its habits. Slight indications, which we should be at a loss to enumerate separately, betray what changes are going on and what promptings are simmering in the organism. Hence the expression of a face or figure, 
hence the traces of habit and passion visible in a man and that indescribable something about him which inspires confidence or mistrust the gift of reading character is partly instinctive partly a result of experience it may amount to foresight and is directed not upon consciousness but upon past or eventual action habits and passions however have metaphorical psychic names names indicating dispositions rather than particular acts a disposition being mythically represented as a sort of wakeful and haunting genius waiting to whisper suggestions in a man's ear we may accordingly delude ourselves into imagining that a pose or a manner which really indicates habit indicates feeling instead in truth the feeling involved if conceived at all is conceived most vaguely and is only a sort of reverberation or penumbra surrounding the pictured activities side note conduct divined consciousness ignored it is a mark of the connoisseur to be able to read character and habit and to divine at a glance all a creature's potentialities this sort of penetration characterizes the man with an eye for horse flesh the dog fancier and men and women of the world it guides the born leader in the judgments he instinctively passes on his subordinates and enemies it distinguishes every good judge of human affairs or of natural phenomena who is quick to detect small but telling indications of events past or brewing as the weather prophet reads the heavens so the man of experience reads other men nothing concerns him less than their consciousness he can allow that to run itself off when he is sure of their temper and habits a great master of affairs is usually unsympathetic his observation is not in the least dramatic or dreamful he does not yield himself to animal contagion or reenact other people's inward experience he is too busy for that and too intent on his own purposes his observation on the contrary is straight calculation and inference and it sometimes reaches truths about people's character and destiny which they themselves are very far from divining such apprehension is masterful and odious to weaklings who think they know themselves because they indulge in copious soliloquy which is the discourse of brutes and madmen but who really know nothing of their own capacity situation or fate if rousseau for instance after writing those confessions in which candor and ignorance of self are equally conspicuous had heard some intelligent friend like hume draw up in a few words an account of their author's true and contemptible character he would have been loud in protestations that no such ignoble characteristics existed in his eloquent consciousness and they might not have existed there because his consciousness was a histrionic thing and as imperfect an expression of his own nature as of man's when the mind is irrational no practical purpose is served by stopping to understand it because such a mind is irrelevant to practice and the principles that guide the man's practice can be as well understood by eliminating his mind altogether so a wise governor ignores his subject's religion or concerns himself only with its economic and temperamental aspects if the real forces that control life are understood the symbols that represent those forces in the mind may be disregarded but such a government like that of the british in india is more practical than sympathetic while wise men may endure it for the sake of their material interests they will never love it for itself there is nothing sweeter than to be sympathized with while nothing requires a rarer intellectual heroism than willingness to see one's equation written out Side note. 
consciousness untrustworthy. Nevertheless, this same algebraic sense for character plays a large part in human friendship. A chief element in friendship is trust, and trust is not to be acquired by reproducing consciousness, but only by penetrating to the constitutional instincts which, in determining action and habit, determine consciousness as well. Fidelity is not a property of ideas. It is a virtue, possessed preeminently by nature, from the animals to the seasons and the stars. But fidelity gives friendship its deepest sanctity and the respect we have for a man, for his force, ability, constancy and dignity, is no sentiment evoked by his floating thoughts but an assurance founded on our own observation that his conduct and character are to be counted upon. Smartness and vivacity, much emotion and many conceits are obstacles both to fidelity and to merit. There is a high worth in rightly constituted natures independent of incidental consciousness. It consists in that ingrained virtue which under given circumstances would ensure the noblest action and with that action, of course, the noblest sentiments and ideas. Ideas which would arise spontaneously and would make more account of their objects than of themselves. Side note, metaphorical mind. The expression of habit in psychic metaphors is a procedure known also to theology. Whenever natural or moral law is declared to reveal the divine mind, this mind is a set of formal or ethical principles rather than an imagined consciousness reenacted dramatically. What is conceived is the God's operation, not his emotions. In this way, God's goodness becomes a symbol for the advantages of life, his wrath a symbol for its dangers, his commandments a symbol for its laws. The deity spoken of by the Stoics had exclusively this symbolic character. It could be called a city, dear city of Zeus, as readily as an intelligence. And that intelligence, which ancient and ingenuous philosophers said they saw in the world, was always intelligence in this algebraic sense. It was intelligible order. Nor did the Hebrew prophets, in their emphatic political philosophy, seem to mean much more by Jehovah than a moral order, a principle giving vice and virtue their appropriate fruits. Side note. Summary. True society, then, is limited to similar beings living similar lives and enabled by the contagion of their common habits and arts to attribute to one another, each out of his own experience, what the other actually endures. A fresh thought may be communicated to one who has never had it before, but only when the speaker so dominates the auditor's mind by the instrumentalities he brings to bear upon it that he compels that mind to reproduce his experience. Analogy between actions and bodies is accordingly the only test of valid inference regarding the existence or character of conceived minds. But this eventual test is far from being the source of such a conception. Its source is not inference at all, but direct emotion and the pathetic fallacy. In the beginning, as in the end, what is attributed to others is something directly felt, a dream dreamed through and dramatically enacted, but uncritically attributed to the object by whose motions it is suggested and controlled. In a single case, however, tertiary qualities happen to correspond to an experience actually animating the object to which they are assigned. This is the case in which the object 
is a body similar in structure and action to the percipient himself, who assigns to that body a passion he has caught by contagion from it and by imitation of its actual attitude. Such are the conditions of intelligible expression and true communion. Beyond these limits nothing is possible save myth and metaphor or the algebraic designation of observed habits under the name of moral dispositions. End of chapter 6